Therefore, I began with a quote from Toni Morrison, taken from her article in The Nation, published on March 23rd, 2015, in celebration of the magazine's 150th anniversary. She writes, quote, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to forget or not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art, end quote. Here, Morrison reminds us that language is not arbitrary, absent-minded speech, but a powerful action that is central to the healing of civilizations and thus most critical in any nation's time of tragedy and despair. As I speak to you now virtually, instead of in one of your illustrious auditoriums on your beautiful campus, sitting in front of this camera, having literally tested positive for COVID-19 just two days ago, we are reminded that over a year later, we are still living in the midst of a global pandemic. With over 562,000 deaths in the US due to COVID-19, Another unnecessary death by a police officer, sustained unemployment, increased racially motivated violence against Asian Americans, and so much more. We can see that our nation is truly in a time of tragedy and despair. And while many are at work with their hands, tonight my encouragement is for us to, to in the words of Toni Morrison, do language. Morrison's admonition to do language did not first appear in her essay for the nation in 2015. In fact, Morrison's infamous lecture upon reception of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993 is where she first introduced the concept to the world. In this speech, Morrison exposes how, in fact, we do language on a daily basis. She declares, quote, oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. With these lines, Morrison is trying to re-educate us on a global scale to the notion that language does not just signify reality. It is not exclusively a mirror of those things that are, but it is in fact the very power that conjures forth and brings forth whatever is spoken. She continues, quote, it is the language that drinks blood, laps vulnerabilities, tucks its fascist boot under crinolines of respectability and patriotism as it moves relentlessly toward the bottom line and the bottomed out mind. Sexist language, racist language, theistic language, all are typical of the policing languages of mastery and cannot, do not permit new language or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas, end quote. In other words, our violent acts, our vulnerabilities, our insecurities, our fears, our hopes, our beliefs, and our social hierarchies are all constructed and composed by language. They are maintained by language. They exist and thrive because of the words spoken and the meanings that communities have given them over time. Morrison goes so far as to suggest that the sexist, racist, and theistic language of our time is so restrictive that it is not allowing for the generation of new knowledge or the mutual exchange of ideas. In other words, Morrison believes that our current systems of language as they are, are inhibiting us from even having healthy dialogue, let alone compose an alternative reality that works for the betterment of all people. 
Literary and linguistic theorists have been in conflict and dialogue concerning the notion of language's inherent power to construct societies for decades. Stanley Fish's theory of interpretive communities provides a fascinating framework for how communities read, and it reveals intuitively the truth of language's ability to construct or destroy a society. Between 1975 and 1980, Fish argued that any interpretation of a text, let's say a poem, for example, is not lifted from the text, but instead it is inscribed upon it is based on a set of intentions, systems, strategies, and rules that exist within the reader rather than the text itself. Fish believes, quote, that meanings are not extracted but made, and made not by encoded forms, but by interpretive strategies that call forms into being, end quote. Fish would agree with Jacques Derrida's formula of the sign, which is made up of the signifier and the signified to this extent, that the names we have given things are a direct result of the interpretive community's intentions and values, and not because the object possesses anything inherently requiring that it be given the particular signifier that it has been assigned. This is particularly true when we consider the text that is the human body and the sign that is our current system of racial categorization. Since the late 1400s and the spread of colonialism, Europeans have sought to classify and understand the differences that appear across humanity phenotypically. The moment this became a need, language was birthed to both assign a label to our human differences, as well as systems of value to those differences. This is especially seen in the 19th century during the rise of phrenology, a pseudoscience founded by German physiologist Franz Joseph Gull. The study of skull shape as an indicator of mental capacity and brain function, Gall's findings were particularly used to assert the inherent superiority of white Europeans and the inferiority of non-white Europeans. This takes great precedence in the U.S. around the 1830s and 40s as physicians like Charles Caldwell began to use Gall's research as evidence that African people were best suited as chattel slaves given they supposedly did not have the mental ability to produce anything of value to civilization apart from manual labor given the shape of their skulls. I always find this to be fascinating given the uh, history and the particularly the architectural history that is found in ancient Egypt. When we really study the civilizations of ancient Africa, I feel as though it is evidence in and of itself that any kind of pseudoscience suggesting this is really absurd. Samuel George Morton further does the language of racism with his book Crania America or a comparative view of the skulls of various aboriginal nations of North and South America. Published in 1839 and identified as the foundational text for scientific racism, Morton's book provides detailed descriptions of skull configurations, as well as racial classifications, definitions, and labels. His work also makes determinations on different people groups' abilities to acquire knowledge, produce art, and even assigns criminality and immorality to African and Native American skulls. This troubling language was so destructive and effective that historians document that it was influential in former President Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policies, and it further encouraged westward expansion and the theft of native lands. I'm taking the time to lay this foundation to show you the intricate connection between the words that we create and compose and the cultural systems and laws that we enforce. See, before we can see how language can create something new, healing, restorative, and resistant. We must first see how it is that destructive language sits at the center of our unjust policies and practices. As Toni Morrison said, this oppressive language did not simply describe violence, but it was violence. In fact, one could even argue that it created violence that had not previously existed before. America has been on a never-ending spiral of violent and oppressive language ever since it determined as an interpretive community to read human bodies like texts, applying superiority and inferiority, uh, or, or, or applying superiority and inherent value to the bodies of white Europeans, while contrastingly assigning inferiority, criminality, and immorality to the bodies of Black and Native Americans.
This language was not just a silent reality, but generations of Black and Indigenous people still living today read signs, or read signs rather, like colored water fountain, colored entrance, colored bathroom, colored seating, in the same way that we see stop signs at the corners of our roads. These signs were not just psychologically degrading because they labeled persons as colored, but the label and the community's intent and meaning behind the label that was that was what the the violence of such language became. It was the intent of the American interpretive community to use such violence as a weapon to constantly remind African Americans that they were secondary citizens, unwelcome in establishments, unallowed to sit at the front of trains and buses. They are of a lesser species that they could not even share a restroom with white persons. It was the meaning of such language that colored was associated with filth, illiteracy, inferiority, violence, criminality, a constant reminder that there is a newly emancipated people whose mental and physical capacity is no greater than chattel and their emancipation puts all whites at risk of danger and disease. So that the violence of language falls not in the phonetic spelling of the word colored, but in the American community's interpretation and usage of such a word as a derogatory descriptive. In order to combat such narrative lives, African Americans employed the use of language to reestablish their humanity, their value, and provide themselves the encouragement that they needed. The first clause of my title for our dialogue this evening is Say It Loud. This was taken from a famous song by American singer and songwriter James Brown. In August 1968, months after the uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Brown felt that African Americans needed a reminder of their value. Pinning, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud on a napkin, Brown soon lost most of his crossover audience as the American interpretive community believed the slogan was, quote, militant and angry. Heralded in the voices of children because Brown wanted Black children to grow up taking pride in themselves, he died believing that, quote, maybe because of the line about dying on your feet instead of living on your knees, end quote, was the reason that the song was misunderstood and thus categorized as militant and angry. What is critical for us to understand is that while James Brown's intent behind the language, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, was to serve as a chant of racial, ethnic, and cultural pride, the American interpretive community will always perceive the empowerment of their historically disenfranchised class as a threat to their historical narratives and thus an attack on their interpretive practices and a threat to their socioeconomic status. This is because we must remember that that language is always at work to determine, assert, and maintain a social order. Any new language that threatens that social order, even if it merely seeks to emotionally uplift the disinherited, it is a threat to the American interpretive community's social hierarchy and thus their systems of operation. It is for this reason that language has always been a weapon in the African-American arsenal for justice. Just as Jason Delgandio teaches in his book, Rhetoric for Radicals, that, quote, as we change our communication, we change our world, end quote. So do African-Americans ever work to change their communication, compose new language, and thus remain committed to, human to the human responsibility of changing our world. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a figure whose work and impact on the world is intimately connected to rhetoric and communication. What is unfortunate is that Dr. King has been freeze-framed into one moment in time on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, where the totality of his life and the catalog of his writings are summed up in the conclusion of his infamous speech, I Have a Dream. A speech calling attention to the gross socioeconomic injustices that America has inflicted upon Africans in America, one of the most important lines of his speech has little to do with racial integration and more to do with reparations. In fact, this line is at the beginning of his speech. King declared, quote, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. 
When the architects of our Republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was the promise that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned, end quote. King goes on employing economic imagery to arouse within the within the emotions of the hearer the pain and stark reality of what it feels like to live a life as though you have received a bad check. King declares that while Blacks in America have been told there are insufficient funds, meaning that America is socially unable, socially bankrupt, and incapable of making good on the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as relates to African Americans, quote, we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity in this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice, end quote. The language here is beautiful, powerful, and persuasive. Here, King employs economic metaphor to invoke the pathos needed for the American interpretive community to understand that what African Americans are requesting is not more than what has been given the dominant culture within society, but instead they are requesting the same. They are requesting equity. In essence, we have been promised something socially, morally, and economically, and the request of this moment is that the American interpretive community understand the intent and the meaning behind this language so that they might then make good on their debt. This is what gives credence to his dream of his four children living in a nation, quote, where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, end quote. This declaration and sermonic celebration post the articulation of his holistic political, economic, and social agenda is what buttresses the line of the greatest focus, where he says little Black girls and Black boys will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. That one line was not the focus nor the message of the speech, but instead it is a secondary byproduct of an American interpretive community that rectifies the debt that it owes to Blacks in America. Dr. King was not the only great American imaginative linguist, but the great American writer James Baldwin too was committed to a use of language that called for America to rise to the better morals espoused in her founding documents. In his 1962 classic, The Fire Next Time, Baldwin writes a letter to his 15-year-old nephew and namesake, James. In it, Baldwin recounts to his nephew how, quote, the police, the police would whip you and take you in as long as they could get away with it, end quote. And he then lends his voice of rebuke, not only to racist policing practices, but to Christian hypocrisy and the positive impact of the most often misunderstood nation of Islam. In fact, Baldwin's language is so strong that he states, quote, if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him, end quote. This is a critical statement for we must remember that Baldwin's audience is his nephew, i.e. other African-American readers. Therefore, Baldwin's admonition to African-American readers in 1962 is that their understanding of the Christian God's involvement in their liberation is broken and that their current engagement with faith is so problematic that both their faith and their God are insufficient in the goal of racial justice within the African-American interpretive community. So that while King is called calling for and using economic language to call for the social, the legal, the moral and financial reparations of African-Americans on the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. Baldwin is calling for the composition of new religious language that eliminates the hypocrisies inherent to American Christianity so that Blacks can compose not just a new God who is a better advocate for their current troubles, but he also calls for the composition of language that encourages a new kind of faith in action, hence the fire next time. 
Baldwin is suggesting that Blacks must advocate or activate a kind of justice for themselves that seeks to destroy the oppressive languages and systems that were and that are not simply uh, alive through those systems until an imagined better day. Again, the words we use and the meanings and intent behind them serve as the force working to destroy that which has been denigrating and disenfranchising so that something new can be created. Patrice Cullors and those committed to today's Black Lives Matter movement engage in a similar work. In fact, Angela Davis, the famous and internationally acclaimed activist, author, and professor, speaks of the importance of this work in her foreword to Cullors memoir, When They Call You a Terrorist, a Black Lives Matter memoir. In the foreword, Angela Davis writes of the work that we must do to critically combat the rhetoric of terrorism. She explains that this rhetoric of terrorism has, quote, occasioned and justified a global surge in Islamophobia, has impeded thoughtful reflection on the continued occupation of Palestine, but also attempts to discredit anti-racist movements in the United States, end quote. Here, Davis provides examples of contemporary ways in which the language of terrorism within the American interpretive community is still at work. She further explains why phrases like Black power, Black pride, and especially Black lives matter remains a linguistic challenge for the American interpretive community. Quote, the seemingly simple phrase Black lives matter has disrupted undisputed assumptions about the logic of equality, justice, and human freedom in the United States and all over the world. It has encouraged us to question the capacity of logic, Western logic, to undo the forces of history, especially the history of colonialism and slavery. This logic expresses itself through our philosophical certainties and ideological presuppositions and in our legal system, which, for example, allows for the incarceration of disproportionate numbers of Black people, immigrants from the global South, and people of recent immigrant ancestry, justifying the structural racism of such practices with references to due process and other ostensible legal guarantees of equality, end quote. Davis provides here an in-depth analysis of the social surgery that the language Black Lives Matter is providing, not just to the American interpretive community, but the American mass incarceration complex. In disrupting the historical Western narrative of colonialism, enslavement, and African inferiority, the phrase Black Lives Matter works to destroy such oppressive and violent language while simultaneously asserting an old message with new language, that people of African descent are not inferior, that we are human, that we have value, that we are deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This brings into question the validity and power of social media in the fight for racial justice, specifically social uh, and social justice more broadly. Activists like Sean King will tell you plainly that while social media cannot be the only means by which a person engages in the fight, it is in fact a very real and viable weapon. In fact, he I had the, the pr pleasure of interviewing him for a podcast that I do with the magazine that I work for. And in the interview, we got to talk at length about some of the um, tweets towards various politicians and leaders that he has done. And what many don't know is that literally he, because of the breadth and the, the, the vastness of his audience, he is literally asked oftentimes by the victims of police brutality or by the victims of racial injustice to literally tweet at the various uh, politicians, leaders, or establishments that need to enact justice on a particular Black person's behalf. He's asked to do this because his audience is so large that if he quote unquote drags them on Twitter and if he calls them a variety of names and if he is mean and demeaning and derogatory, usually that institution, that entity, that individual, that uh, uh, leader or politician has the necessary social pressure to then make the change or the uh, um, What's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the civil decision that works in favor 
of black people, whether that be at large or, or, or for the, the greater community or for an individual black family. And so what we see here is that the language that he uses, the tweets that he does are in fact extremely effective in applying the necessary social pressure to create the necessary structural change that allows for racial justice. This has caused Sean King to be an intimate, central figure in getting uh, Black district attorneys elected to office. It has caused Black families to get millions of dollars in settlements. It has caused um, politicians to be switched out. Uh, literally, it is impacting structural change. However, even he would suggest and tell you that that kind of work only goes so far. The tweeting only goes so far. That uh, uh, w there must be a combination of works that goes along with our tweeting so that we can say that language on social media is a very real and viable weapon. But what is critical is that language as a constructive and destructive weapon for justice works best when speech is partnered with action. In other words, once Black Lives Matter has been declared, what does such language cause your feet to do? What are the new systems you create, the new doctrines you compose, the new laws you enforce, the new protections you put in place so that the words, the signs that are ultimately matched with a signified and a signifier, that the language that is uh, soon given an intent, a meaning and a significance from a community, it is then that language truly takes force. It is then that language possesses its most powerful powerful uh, 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 influence. For if the language never manifests in these ways, the new language was never really composed. The words that were uttered oftentimes then fade into the oblivion of the user, but they never take constructive root within the interpretive community to produce the necessary work for critical social change. Dr. Mark Lamont Hill in his book, Nobody, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint and Beyond. He records the language of a grieving woman who witnessed the murder of Michael Brown. Speaking to Hill, the woman expressed her displeasure with how Brown's body laid in the street next to her apartment complex, uncovered and unattended for four hours. She said, quote, they just left him there like he ain't belong to nobody, end quote. In that moment, the word nobody takes on a different meaning for the Black American interpretive community. Hill expresses this in his book. He writes, quote, nobody, no parents who loved him, no community that cared for him, no medical establishment morally compelled to save him. No state duty bound to invest in him before or after his death. Michael Brown was treated as if he was not entitled to the most basic elements of democratic citizenship, not to mention human decency. He was treated as if he was not a person, much less an American. He was disposable. End quote. In this moment, Hill connects the need for social, political, and legislative change surrounding policing as a whole, but especially the policing of Black bodies, to the emotion generating language of nobodiness, as he calls it. By calling the reader's attention to the depths of nobodiness that Michael Brown experienced, Hill suggests this is a level of inhumanity that most, if not all Black Americans are familiar with. This reconfiguration of this term created a kind of solidarity within the Black interpretive community during a time of great grief and despair that was most needed. It provided us with the language that we needed to feel seen and heard and understood with the loss of so many Black persons to police violence. But it also created 
language that the specific systems and structures within the larger American interpretive community could understand. The nobodiness described here is a direct indictment of the American policing medical systems, policing and medical systems, let alone the political system that permits American citizens, citizens to be treated as the equivalent of roadkill. It is from this place of deep moral, political, and social reform that Dr. Michael Eric Dyson in his book, Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America, declares that, quote, all of us, from agreeable agnostics to fire and brimstone Protestants, from devout Catholics to observant Jews, from devoted Muslims to those who claim no God at all, share a language of moral repair. That language is our common meeting ground, our tool of analysis, and yes, our inspiration for repentance, our hope for redemption, end quote. For Dyson, there must be a language of moral repair that cuts through the deafening silence and the crushing indifference. This is the language that, regardless of community, sees that time does not heal all wounds, that our redemption and our hope can never be an eventuality, but will come only in the power of linguistic intentionality. Language constructs and destroys our society. Are we willing to, as Toni Morrison admonishes us, to do language and compose and build a society that works towards the wholeness of all humanity? Are we willing to speak words that might offend at first so they can heal generations to come? Are we willing to speak words that share old messages in new ways? Are we willing to commit to expressing a kind of language that our American interpretive community as a whole is forced to receive so that the systems and structures within it might change for the betterment of all? Are we willing to have the hard conversations in our immediate spheres of influences, our school, our homes, our jobs, our churches, our faith communities, so that we know that because of our work doing language, that we have thus created the necessary ripple in order to affect real change within our larger American community. Can we together say it loud that Black Lives Matter? And in that declaration, can we oppose the violence of racist language and articulate the power, beauty, and value of difference? Can we, with our language, commit to creating a world that restores and repairs what oppressive and violent language has destroyed. Thank you so much for your time.